Welcome to this week's first session of our Harnessing AI course. So nice to see so many people here on this fine day. <coughs> well, up to this point, we've been discussing several kinds of artificial intelligence machines. We talked about rule-based machines. We talked about supervised learning machines. We talked about unsupervised learning. <clears throat> and we see that this follows a progression of increasing machine learning power. The question is, what's next? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And how about machines that have the, the ability to increase human learning power? So that's, that's what we'll be talking about today. Let me give you a, <clears throat> an example of, of this. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University named Louis Van Ahn, and he invented a category of games that he called social games, but the purpose of them was to accomplish a purpose by having a team of a human and a machine work together. And in this case, he was doing something for Google. Google had a very large number of images online, but they weren't labeled, and so Google couldn't search them and they needed to label the images. So Vanan invented a game where players would log into the game. The game would present two randomly selected players with the same picture. The uh, players would then type a label into a box, and if they both typed the same label, that label became the label of the picture, and whoever typed it first got a game point. And they, this, they got thousands of people to play in this game, and. and and labeled uh, tens of thousands of images in the Google database. So at that point in time, nobody knew how to have a machine label images. It was just, it had to be done by human beings. And so this game was a way of mobilizing a lot of people to help label the images. Well, of course, as you've heard since that time, we've learned a lot about how to build machines that can label images. So we don't need that game anymore. So we're on to much more sophisticated games. Another famous example was in the late 1990s, in 1997, as a matter of fact, when IBM's big blue computer chess program beat the world chess master, the world grand chess master Garry Kasparov. And <coughs> the newspapers were full of stories celebrating this major accomplishment of artificial intelligence, and they also celebrated the end of chess. But Kasparov would have nothing to do with that idea about chess was ended. He invented a new kind of chess. He called it advanced chess. And the players in advanced chess were teams consisting of a human and a computer. So, so basically, you could be a chess player and bring your laptop with you running a chess program and play in the tournament. And they found that uh, good chess players accompanied by a good chess program, but neither one being world class, were able to beat the supercomputers. So there's another example of a well-designed collaboration between a human and a machine doing something more than either the human or the machine could do. Well, this topic is the topic of today's uh, talk by Professor Rudy Darkin. Uh, Rudy has been a professor here for a very long time. I don't, uh, he was here when I came 18 years ago. And he's been teaching uh, human machine interface, human computer interface, all that time. He's a pioneer and expert in that field. So um, he's, he's also affiliated with the Moves Institute. But he's here today to talk to you about this whole issue of what does it mean to have humans and machines collaborate with each other, and how do we get more out of the combination that we could get out of either one of them alone. So I introduce you to Rudy Darkin. And welcome him. Is this on? Is my, is my interface properly configured? Um, OK. So um, let's see, I need this. Okay, so um, 
I get this right. All right, so um, what we're going to focus on today is um, I think a lot of times when we talk about intelligent systems, uh, we're largely thinking about uh, some facet of automation, of uh, computing automation. What gets lost in that conversation is the fact that um, a very large number, I'm not going to dare say whether it's more than half, but um, a very large number of applications involving um, some form of intelligence um, have to touch users. They touch people. And the minute they touch us, they become an interface problem. Um, and so that's really what we're going to focus on today. Because the minute they touch a user, um, to some varying degree, um, we, have to th we have to think about uh, what role the user is playing, what role the uh, system is playing, and what are we trying to accomplish. So let's start with something everybody's seen. Is that an intelligent interface? Is there intelligence in this interface? No? Anybody say yes? Where's the intelligence in this interface? I think it's the fact that it's using the English language and our ability to put in a mm -hmm. subject or word that's going to be a language that's understood. Right. So it's got what's called NLP, natural language processing, behind it, right? You can take, type an English sentence into that box. It will parse it and try and figure out what it was you were saying, right? What happens when you just start typing just the first few letters of something in the box? It starts guessing what you're trying to, what you're trying to, what you're trying to, um, trying to search. Where's the guess coming from? coming from the fact that millions of people have searched for things starting with those letters and it tries to figure out what's trending, et cetera, et cetera. These are all AI techniques, right? Everybody in this room can pull out your laptop and do a search on some common term. You will not find two screens that get the same answer. So fundamentally, everything Google does is AI. Everything they do is AI. Okay? Um, so there's a, lot of inter there's a lot of intelligence here. Uh, and sort of begs the question of what intelligence is. You've got to define that first. OK? Try another one. Where's the intelligence in that one? Any thought on that? Well, it starts you with an easy thing. Doesn't it have exactly what you just said, except now it's my voice and now I'm not typing? When I talk to it, don't I speak English? But she figures out what I'm saying. Okay? So what else, what other, what are the other flavors of AI do you see in that interface? That's not really visual. It's not entirely not visual. It has lights on top of it, if you notice. Okay? Um, so it gives you a result back in natural language, right? Um, if you've noticed recently, um, this just happened on mine like about a week and a half ago, um, I was prompted to link my voice print to myself. So now when I ask something, she'll respond recognizing that it's me and not my wife talking to her. And that could be interesting, right? So that's a, another technique, right? I could have my own wish list. She could have her own. I mean, so she knows who's, she knows who's talking to her. Okay? Uh, anybody old enough to know who this guy is? Yes. Yes. This guy is in the, uh, in the dustbin of, of bad UI. Um, what was intelligent about Clippy? Anybody remember? What was it that everybody hated about him so much? Exactly. You'd open Microsoft Word and you'd write, Dear Mom, and he would pop up and say, It looks like you're trying to write a letter. Let me help you with that. And he would proceed to do 18 things that you didn't want him to do. <laughs> right? So this is where uh, the, uh, this is our, uh, if I can pull over here and see if this works. This is that video you just sent, Admiral. 
I got a late, late message from, uh, from Peter. See if you could, this, this is what you were saying, right? How do we do our audio? See, how do we switch over to our display audio? Do you know? Maybe that. Oh, hold on, hold on. Well, sorry guys, I can't figure out how to make it and make noise. Not a very intelligent interface. Right, only Admiral Rondeau knows what was said here. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, the gist of it was you had multiple of these bots that were talking to each other and they were getting it all wrong. Everything was misunderstanding what everybody else was doing. Right, so this is, um, uh, th there's an important point that I want to make here is that in intelligent systems, where you are touching a user, there is traditionally and generally accepted extremely low tolerance for getting it wrong. I always tell people in my uh, user interface class, when you're going to design intelligence, you're going to try and automate anything in a, system, in, a, um, in a system, and you're going to try and guess what they're trying to do, you damn well better be right. Because when you're wrong, they're going to make a big, big issue out of it. Better to let them do it on their own than to try and guess what they're trying to do and get it wrong because Clippy taught us that that's a really bad idea. Okay, so is that an intelligent user interface? Where's the intelligence there? You guys know this one better than I do, hopefully. Is there intelligence out in these interfaces? Do you have, is there assistance coming to you or are you doing everything yourself? You don't think there is any intelligence there? Or there is? Uh huh. Uh huh. Right, and and uh, it's actually a really good example. Of something we're going to get to a little bit later is um, in a scenario like this, uh, you have a problem with you really you never want to delegate too much away from a person because the stakes are too high. Um, so you got, there's cases where that, where that comes into play as well. Same thing here, right, when you get into avionics, um, what type of assistance is there? Is it intelligence assistance or are we relying on the pilot to do the work? Okay, so what we're getting at here is that there's this continuum, all the way from the only two points on this line that we're not talking about are the two endpoints. Because everything in the middle is some combination of my user doing something and, and the hardware doing something, okay? And we have on one side, when we're down over here, we're more talking about the, uh, the AI is augmenting the human. The human's doing most of the work and the AI is just helping you out it's a lot on this side. But as we move over here towards more fully automated systems, uh, you have a different scenario where the human is actually augmenting the AI. The AI is doing most of the work, and a lot, we see this in a lot of um, uh, learning techniques where the machine's doing the work, and the, the human is there to kind of steer and say, no, that's not quite right, this is the right answer, you, should, you did this, you should have done that, where the human's just doing some micro steering, but the system is actually doing the majority of the work, more on this end over here. So what we get is, um, the key to making this work is actually having a way of figuring out. Uh, well, first of all, let me back away for a second and say that um, in the user interface world, we're very sensitive about the word system because very often you think of system and you think of your phone in your pocket. So that's, the, that's a system. My, my tablet, that's a system. My laptop, that's a system. No UI person worth anything would say that. They'd say, because that thing is worth nothing without the person holding it. So the system is you put a rope around the whole thing and you say, when we're trying to get things done, it's the person, the user, and the hardware getting something done. And all we're saying here is that 
to optimize the efficiency, you've got to have some mechanism of figuring out which of those two things does which pieces of the task best. And that's what we really want to focus on. Okay, so this is our job, is to figure out what, uh, we generally want to figure out what the user has to do and then let the computer do the rest. I often say in UI design, uh, one thing to look for is anytime your system asks you a question that it should have already known the answer. How often does that happen to you? All the time, right? All the time, right? It's always asking you for something. It's like, why didn't you know that? Um, one of my favorite examples on that is um, if, I'm, if I'm drafting a document, I'm, I'm putting some PowerPoint slides together, I'm going to send them to Peter. And I'm working on my slides, and I'm in PowerPoint doing my thing. And I immediately jump over. I'm done. I save them to the disk. I go into Outlook. I open up a new, me a new message. I have to tell it it's going to Peter, because it doesn't know it's going to Peter. So I address it to Peter. And then I say, attach file. And my system essentially says, attach what? Any human assistant that said that to you, you'd say, what do you think I want to attach? The thing I've been working on for the past three hours. Yet your machine, everybody's machine, will look at you with a dumb look on its face saying, I don't know what you're talking about. What document do you want to attach? Okay? So this is the sort of context that we're talking about that, that, uh, we, that we want to be able to expect. All right, let's see if this one works. This one doesn't really have sound, so it should be okay. It's going to drive really fast. Okay, automated system. Who's doing what? What's the user responsible for here? Yeah, supervising, right? I mean, there's a reason why he's sitting in that seat and not the other one, right? I mean, if it's fully automated, he may as well be sitting in the other seat, right? Why does he have to sit behind the wheel? He's supervising and he's the just-in-case control. Something goes wrong, I can grab, grab control back. Okay? What else did the user have to do here? He had to say where to go. Might have had some preference on how they were going to go. Stay off the highways. Something. I don't know. Okay? But it's largely an automated task. The user's not doing a lot here. Okay? Come on. There we go. So we want to do what we do best. What do computers do best? They calculate. They can compare. They apply logic, right? Um, they don't mind doing something a few billion times in a row. They got no problem with it. They won't even complain. Um, they can deal with really large data sets. Um, the, uh, here's the trick, though. They require some level of certainty. They require some level of certainty. So I, we have to remind even our computer science, uh, uh, some computer science students from time to time that while we've gotten really good at faking non-deterministic behavior in computers, they are inherently deterministic. It's, what, it's, one, it's a characteristic that defines them. Deterministic means that when you give it the exact same input, you get the exact same output every time. But we said earlier that we're interested in, these, in the mix of a user and a, and a computer. The computer is deterministic. The human is definitely not deterministic. What happens when you take a non-deterministic thing and mix it with a deterministic thing? You get a non-deterministic thing. It's like putting dirty water with clean water. It's dirty water. OK, so they require, computers require certainty. OK, they don't know how to do things. They can, we, can, we can help them to infer uh, 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 and given a new novel uh, uh, condition, what they should do from old uh, conditions, right? But it's only within the bounds of what we told them to do. They don't know how to do stuff that we didn't tell them to do, 
right? So we're going to call this context, but I'm, I'm mixing context with ambiguity, right? So um, uh, computers don't deal with context well because they don't deal with ambiguity, right? So, and we always ask ourselves, is something computable? It's one of the big things you learn when you become a computer scientist and go to school is you should be able to, somebody should be able to describe a problem and you should be able to say, well, that's computable or it isn't. Um, what do humans do? We decide things. And here it's important to keep our minds on, on that when we say decide, we don't just mean big things like what am I going to major in in college? What service am I going to go into? Those are all important big decisions, but there's all kinds of decisions. There's all kinds of decisions. There's decisions deciding, you know, what path you're going to take when you cross campus between classes. These are little micro decisions that you make, and you do it all the time. To be human is to be making decisions constantly. That's what we do. Um, and we're making judgments, like this is a good way to go, that's a bad way to go. I like this, I don't like that. Um, we have preferences. We tire easily and we get bored, right? So the, those are the sorts of tasks that vigilance tasks are not things we're particularly good at. Um, and we function well in ambiguous situ uh, situations. So you give somebody a novel situation that they've never seen anything before, and they adapt better to it than a, than a computer will. And a big part of the problem here is that you can close the gap between these two except for the fact that you don't know what matters. You just don't know what matters um, because the only way I can make my computer act like a, like a person in this case is to literally write code for all the context there could possibly be, and I don't know what that is. All right, so this is the example that, uh, that, that Peter mentioned. And the only thing that I added here that he didn't talk about is after um, uh, Kasparov lost in, uh, in, in 97, and this new thing started popping up um, with, uh, with, with people playing chess with computers, what happened was there was this thing called anti-computer tactics. Anybody have an idea what that is? How many gamers do we have here who play, play computer games? Got a few people? A few people play computer games, right? So when, when you go up and in, in, in you're, you're up against a level that's just really, really hard, you're having a, there's AI behind it, all the adversaries are, are driven by algorithms, and it's a really, really hard level and you're not able to get over it. One thing that most gamers know how to at least try is just do something freaking off the wall. Do something bizarre and you can break the AI. Because the AI it can only plan for things that it thought of, that somebody thought to write code about. That's what an anti-computer tactic actually is, right? So you're playing chess and you just do something that's just not what anybody would expect you to do. And you meld that with good, deep thinking that the computer is good at, right? And thus you end up with two amateurs beating, uh, winning in a grandmaster tournament. Okay? So that's kind of, I mean, you can't really expect the, um, you can't really expect the computer to come up with the bizarre idea. So here's an example of what we uh, uh, dealt with for, for ages. We do a lot of training systems over in the Moves Institute, and you'll have um, a situation where uh, we've got a bunch of guys that are going to breach a door and enter a room. And, okay, that's fine, and there's some adversaries in the room, there's a door on the other side, and you'll find that it's really hard to write code that will actually have your adversary do the obvious thing, which is find another way to come back around you. That's hard to do. That's, that's non-trivial. That's non-trivial. Right? So what do they do? They just keep blazing at you straight, straight on and they end up losing. Right? When in fact, the smart tactic for them is don't try and come back into the, into the room. Come back and loop back around behind me. Okay, so here's a process. And when I wrote this, I sort of chuckled to myself. I said I could, remo I could remove designing intelligence out of this title, and it's the same process. So this is what we do for everything, but I want to highlight a particular piece. So what we do is um, I'm going to design a system. It's going to have lots of automation in it, but it's going to touch a user. Okay, what's my first question? My first question is, what are we accomplishing here? What work are we doing? 
Let's write it down. So we keep our, keep our eye on the ball, okay? So what's our needs analysis? Second, uh, we actually would have in between needs analysis and uh, concurrent with task analysis is asking who our users are. Who are our users? What do they know? What are they doing? Um, then we're going to do a task analysis. We're going to decompose this into finite steps, break it all down so we understand what we're trying to accomplish. And then we've got this important point, this functional analysis, where we've got to divvy it out. We look at the task analysis and we say, which parts of this should the computer be doing? Which parts of this should my user be doing? And everything we can possibly shift to the computer, we probably want to shift to the computer. Um, with the caveat that like we talked about before, that you may have a, a, a situation where I want the computer to do it, but under the oversight of my, of my user. So I don't want it fully automated. I want my user to be able to veto what he does, but I still want the computer to do it. These are all steps in our functional analysis. Then we get into design. Okay, I'm going to give you just some design principles in a moment. This is where we actually start laying it out. What's it going to look like? How does it all fit together? Um, and then we prototype, user test, and we keep repeating this very quickly until we get what we want. That's how we design these interfaces. All right, so here's some, some design hints for you. You think about when you're going to build something with intelligence in it. First of all, you've got to make clear what the system is capable of doing and what the, user does, what the user doesn't have to do. User interfaces are fundamentally about two things. Two things, communication and managing expectation. That's what they are. You get those two things wrong, I guarantee you, you've got a bad interface. So communication is about, we cre we're essentially creating a language. We're saying this is how we're going to be talking back and forth. Um, but here we're talking about expectation. If my user gets into your system that has automation in it, and it has an expectation that this system is going to do something for me that it's not capable of doing, we got a problem. Because either it's not going to get done because, yeah, I thought you were going to do it, you thought I was going to do it, it doesn't happen. Or uh, the system does something that I thought was what it was going to do, but I, it's all incorrect. So it comes crashing down, and we as a system, as a man-machine system, fall apart. Uh, we also want to be able to interrupt the user intelligently. When you've got automation, uh, you often have the part of this dialogue going back and forth between the system and its user. One of the things you want to know is when that system has to get something from you, that it does it intelligently. I had something happen on my iPhone recently where, forget what, what was happening, but at, at some particular point, it decided that it needed my NPS network authentication. And it wasn't going to let me do anything until I gave it my NPS authentication, even though what I was doing had nothing to do with that. Right? So why, again, put this, in, put this in, in terms of a human assistant. How long would that human assistant be working for you if they said, I got to have this right now, but I'm not working on that, but I got to have it right now. Okay? So be intelligent about how you interrupt, um, and, uh, and the system really no should know what you're doing, right, when you're using it. So we also want efficient uh, invocation, correction, uh, and dismissal. So that means uh, invocation is when the system uh, either interrupts or w the way you trigger it, right? So when you talk to Alexa, you say, Alexa something, and you, you say something to her. Um, then if she does, if, imagine you say, Alexa, do something, and she starts doing the wrong thing, right? You have to correct her. Well, actually, in the case of Alexa, you're going to have to stop her before you correct her. Right? So you probably have to say, Alexa, stop. She'll stop talking. You'll repeat what it is you wanted to say. Um, Alexa also has recently uh, the ability to not have to call her name before every single thing you say to her if it happens in a short period of time. Have you tried that one yet? Right? So it'll actually act more like a dialogue. You can say something to her, and as, if you give her a second command that's in a short enough period, she'll know you're talking to her. Okay. So you can string things together and actually create a dialogue. Um, and then you also want to learn from your user's behavior. So you watch what they're doing, and you, you can create models of their behavior. It's a, another topic for another day is then what do you do with that model? Because um, that model, that very same model, this is what 
Facebook is being criticized for, what Google is being criticized for, is in creating a model of you with the idea that we're going to give you a better user experience with their software, that information can also be used for other things. That has nothing to do with you, right? And that raises some eyebrows, right? Okay, so uh, some examples. So this is a, a student that, a CS student just graduated here recently, uh, uh, Major Keller. And so this is an application that came out of uh, Cruiser. So you've got, um, and it's, it's clearly an intelligent system. You've got multiple fairly low cost uh, UAVs in the air. Um, and it's got a mechanism for computing and optimizing um, a, a, a plan, a flight plan for those, for those aircraft. Right, what their, uh, what their elevation is and their actual route. And what they found is lots of times the user gets in and for reasons that the system couldn't possibly have known, you actually want to do something a little different. I actually want this one to be over there and I want this to do this other thing. And what he did was he created an interface, it's a VR interface, but it didn't have to be, um, and you get into the space and the user is able to manipulate this answer, the, the, the routes, and then the system would be able to crunch back behind you and say, okay, it's not going to be optimal anymore. I gave you optimal, and that's, this is not optimal, right? But how suboptimal is it? Because I, you know, your user might say, well, I know what I want to do, but I don't want it to be a bad answer, right? So the system, here you've got the man and the machine are working back and forth because the, the, the human knows of constraints that the system couldn't have known about, and as the human starts giving the constraints, the system is able to give a different answer that meets those constraints. Might not have been as, as good an answer as it was before, but if the constraints are real, that's the best it can do. So there's an example of, a, of an intelligent system behind the scenes with a highly interactive front end uh, where the user is guiding it to an acceptable solution. Let's see if this one works. Um, the, uh, so we're not going to get audio again, obviously. Um, but this is the, what's, uh, they're saying, the future of television. And what's happening here is he's got cameras to the side of the screen. So you see he's pointing at something. He's, so you're not using his voice, or he actually can use his voice, but he can use voice and gesture. There he's pointing at an actress asking who it is, and it responds by figuring out um, who it is. Okay, so it's doing facial expression, right? Now in this case, what he's doing is he's looking away. The camera realizes he's not watching, and the video paused. I saw that, and I kind of laughed, and I thought, you know, there's a lot of times when what I'm watching is boring, and that's why I'm looking away. I want you to keep going. I'll come back when you're more interesting. Um, but here you'd come back, and it'd be exactly where it was. Okay, so there you got an idea of, of, of a system through sensors and um, it, you can do behavioral modeling behind this. They can figure out what sorts of, uh, of, of actions certain people kind of make and what those, what those actions mean. Um, and you end up with a, a, far, uh, a far better user experience. Let's see if I can go to the next one here. Okay, so here is, uh, this is from, uh, I believe it's iRobot, um, and she's going to be guiding, uh, she's going to be guiding this robot, also has cameras. There we go. Okay, so you've got a tracked, a tracked robot uh, with cameras. This one actually has some pretty obvious military rele relevance, particularly where you don't want to use your voice. Um, so you can give hand signals to it and it'll respond. All right, so now you're going to watch, she's going to be walking down the hall in an office there. So she's told it to stop and now it's going to follow. And it knows to follow her at a safe distance so it doesn't run up on her heels. You'll notice in a second that you've got another guy crossing over in front of her. It knows who she is. Now she's going to tell it to stop. She's going to walk into that office. The other guy is going to walk out. It's not going to follow her. It's going to it's follow him. It's going to follow her. So this guy comes out. That's not who I'm following. <laughs> it knows not to follow. Follow her. And here we go. Okay? So you get the idea, right? So there's a lot of people working on these sorts of, uh, of interfaces uh, to deal with, uh, with uh, complex user interfaces. And then, 
see if I can get. You got to talk about this one, right? Yeah. But remember this scene? Yeah. Okay, so this is without audio for those of you who haven't seen for the for the one or two of you who haven't seen this movie. Um, the, the, this is the scene after Hal has read their lips and realizes they want, they're talking about turning them off. And he's got a mission directive that says you have to do this and you're not even supposed to let your human operators override you. Can you imagine this on a Navy ship, right? I, I, I want to do this. And the system says, no, nope, we're going to fire now. You can't turn me off. We're going to fire now. Um, so here he is trying to come back in. He's trying to dock and Hal isn't letting him. Because Hal's got him right where he wants him. Right? So this is um, automation gone awry. Somebody did a bad user analysis, a task analysis in this one, and automated just a wee bit too much to the system. Yeah, so he's in that little pod trying to dock, and Hal is not going to let him back in. OK, so let me, let me wrap up with this. So here's what I want you to remember is that most systems, I use them putting that in quotes because I want you to think of a system particularly as including the people, person or people who are using it. All right? And we're usually the weak link. We're usually the weak link, which is why UI is, continues to be an important part of uh, computer science. Um, but it's usually a combination. Most of the things we care about are a combination. And if you really want to maximize this efficiency, you have to have a way of figuring out what the system is going to do, what the person is going to do, and how the two of them are going to work together to get an outcome that neither one of them could have really gotten on their own. Okay? And the most important thing is that we actually have a, we know how to do this. We have a process of designing interfaces for intelligent systems that will answer the questions, that will at least lead you to the path of where you can answer these questions that give you what you need to know uh, to build an effective uh, user interface on an intelligent system. Okay, are there any questions that I can answer? <laughs>